The session today is entitled Leading Global Innovation. And here we're going to be talking about innovation and global innovation from a country and a regional perspective. So how do we see uh, the trends playing out? Uh, in the future, can we see different countries, different regions standing up and driving innovation, perhaps in a very different way uh, to how we see that today? I just want to flag that this session is on the record, um, so we welcome the reporting press here, and the session will be live streamed as well for posterity. The way we are going to run the session is uh, quite unusual as well. We're going to run it as a debate, which means that I'm going to put my wonderful panelists on the spot. I'm going to ask some of them to argue passionately, uh, uh, with, with enormous emotion, for a question. I'm going to ask others to argue against a motion. Um, later in the debate, we might allow them to nuance their points a little bit more. Um, but in the, in the first instance, we really want to hear um, why uh, they believe that a particular uh, um, uh, trend may come true. We're going to test how convincing they are, because at the start of this session, we're going to ask you your view, and then ask you the same question at the end of the session and see if you changed your mind and how convincing the speakers were. Um, now, we're unfortunately going to do our question in uh, a little bit of an old-fashioned way. We're going to ask you to raise your hand, <laughs> uh, proving, of course, again, that humans can be uh, ex far more sophisticated than uh, machines. The question we're going to pose during the next hour is, will the West soon be surpassed as, a, as the world's innovation powerhouse? Okay, will the West soon be surpassed as the world's innovation powerhouse? And I have to say that those of uh, the panel who are arguing yes may have things slightly easier following uh, the Premier's uh, speech just earlier today. Um, but I look forward to hearing all of the arguments. So to start off with, I would like everyone in the audience here to raise their hand if you think that the West will soon be surpassed as the world's innovation powerhouse. Put your hands up now. Ah, very few, in fact. I would say that's a 2% yes. Very scientific. And so, will the West soon be surpassed as the world's innovation powerhouse? Those of you who think no, Okay, that's the majority, and others who have not put their hand up are either undecided or asleep. Okay, there are quite a few of you as well, so let's see how that changes towards the end of the, the hour. So, let me introduce our uh, wonderful speakers here today. I have, um, to, just to my right, Kevin Sneeder, who is the chairman of McKinsey & Company's Asia uh, practice, an Asia office. Um, I have, to my right, Chen Jianglang, who is the Vice President of the Association of Science and Technology here in uh, China. And I just saw recently you had a fantastic um, event inviting teenagers from all around the world to uh, talk about their own <laughs> innovations, which was uh, quite extraordinary. To my left, Amy Wilkinson is the author of The Creator's Code. I was delighted to see that one of the six uh, principles was about uh, keeping in touch with a diverse network. So this is very good. And I believe you're uh, uh, just about to publish a new That's book, right. which perhaps we can get some little bits of insight from today. Opposite, I have Michael Danberg, who is the Minister for Innovation in Sweden. Sweden, of course, as you know, comes in the top 10 of pretty much every innovation index because of a vast range of factors. So it's very well placed to argue that the West will not be surpassed. <laughs> and Francis Gurry joins us. He's the Director General of the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization, which of course protects intellectual property rights and uh, is one of the co-authors of the Global Innovation Index, uh, which ranks countries to see how they are doing on the basis of innovation. And your report will be coming out just next week, I think, so we look forward to seeing how that changes. Last year, 2014, you said that China will be very soon on the top 25, uh, I believe. So we'll be interested to hear your views here. So 
As you recall, I'm going to call on each person in turn, and they are going to be arguing vehemently for or against <laughs> one of these positions, OK? So to start with, Kevin, I'm going to call on you. I would like to understand why you think, yes, actually, everyone in this room, or the majority of people in this room, are wrong. And the West <laughs> will soon be surpassed as the world's innovation powerhouse. Thank you. Well, it's probably not a good idea to tell the audience they're wrong. So instead, what I'm going to say is they're open-minded. And when they hear the facts, they will join the case that says, if the West has not already been surpassed, then it soon will be. Because I think it is important to have a look at the different types of innovation. And then just ask ourselves the question, is the question that's being asked already been answered with a yes in at least half the times? Because I think if you look at the different types of innovation that are out there, we have consumer-based innovation. We have engineering-based innovation. We have science-based innovation. And we have process or efficiency types of innovation. I want to take a moment and talk about the four. Because I'm going to argue today that in two of them, the case has already been made that the West is going to be passed, if not already passed. And in the other two, the writing is on the wall. So let's just start with the most obvious one, consumers. Where are the world's consumers? Well, actually, we're sitting in the place where a lot of them are, here in China. China has the largest single consumer market. And if you actually just step back and look at its sheer size, just one little example, the Chinese market for online gaming is bigger than, let's say, the Turkish market for cars. And you can go through market after market where the sheer size of China gives it a laboratory in which Chinese companies are operating and learning from an enormous amount of customer feedback. And they're using that. That is why, if we look at e-commerce today, the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent triangle already dominates in terms of innovation and in terms of pushing the frontiers and what can happen. It's innovating in terms of the types of e-commerce and the way things are funded with Alipay, Alifinance. I'm not here to advertise any one of those companies, but I don't think it takes very long to just look at the pace and rate of innovation that they are advancing to realize that the advantage China has in terms of the size of its consumer base, the learning that that provides, means that we're already seeing one part of the innovation market that has already headed east. The second place I'd like to point to and say I think this type of innovation also lends itself to answering the question with a very solid yes is when we look at efficiency or process-based innovation. As you well know, this is also the largest market for the auto companies. And not just the auto companies, but in market after market, chemicals, the large commodity markets where process matters. What has ended up happening is the sheer Focus means that these companies are bringing to their Chinese counterparts the latest and greatest innovation. And it's getting improved. Why is it getting improved? Because again, if you want to be successful in this market, you've got to constantly improve, constantly find new ways of doing things on the process front. And I would argue that that is already manifesting itself in the reason why this part of the world, and let's not forget Japan's been doing this for years, but on the efficiency, the improvement of process, here in the East, we're already past the West. But I think what happens and why people instinctively answer the question with a no, and then I ask them to think twice, is because for many people, innovation conjures up the notion of the big scientific breakthrough. Mm. And it is true. That is where thus far, I think the West has held sway. But let's just pause and reflect on a few things. Let's take engineering-based innovation. This year, China will graduate 1.2 million engineers you get to add up the next five countries and you still have less than 1.2 million engineers. The engineering talent that has been generated just in China, then you add to that Japan with its long heritage of great engineering skills. And let's not forget Korea. And I think you can make the case that while today it is true that I think on the engineering front the West still holds, it's not going to be long before we see that shift east as well. And then let's take me to the last area, science-based innovation. Again, we think of the big pharmaceutical companies, and yes, they are inherently products of the West. And it is true that in this area, I do think there is a lot that the West has by way of advantage. Better intellectual property rights, greater returns to those companies, a thriving private sector. But I question also whether, again, the focus and the need for medicine, the focus and the need for scientific breakthrough, and indeed the sheer scale of the intellectual capital that is now being developed albeit at the moment it's quantity over quality, but that will shift. Whether anyone can really stand here and guarantee that somehow there is an inherent reason why the West will always lead in science-based innovation, which is the only one of the four 
I would be prepared to concede is a genuine open question when so many other forces favor the East when it comes to the question that you've asked. And let me just close with a few thoughts. I don't think it's, uh, anything is inexorable. There are lots of things that could change between now and then. But let us remember where we're sitting. $200 billion of R&D spend in China alone. $200 billion, 2% 2 of GDP. Going up, we'll see how much it goes up. You heard the Premier today, so the commitment is there. A country of the size that we're talking about with Japan and Korea and their innovation heritage and other parts of Asia too. And I just think it would be rather wrong to think that the West has the right to dominate the world of innovation. Instead, what I think will happen is we'll see a rebalancing. And that's why my answer to yes only requires you to believe that there's enough doubt in the case for no, i.e. if you have doubts that the West is going to hold sway, then you should join us in answering yes, because it looks to me that the forces are at least ones which say there's going to be a balance, and the balance between East and West is rapidly coming. Thank you, Kevin. So you've heard a model of four different types of innovation in which, and in every single one, uh, the seeds of, be, of, of uh, the West being surpassed are present. Michael, perhaps respond to that, that model from your perspective. Now, you're going to tell us that, in fact, the, won't, the West won't be surpassed soon, and here's why. I think the question is put the wrong way, and this is my answer, because I think you should ask yourself, which kind of society will attract talent and creativity? Where does it flourish? Where does it happen? And that's the basic point I would like to argue. It's not about East and West, it's about society and how it functions. Uh, and then, if I, if I look at Sweden, for instance, it's quite unique. We're nine million people, small country up in the north of Europe. Uh, how can we produce these kind of fantastic, great companies all over the world? How, how come Ericsson has produced uh, networks that uh, facilitates the services of almost 40% of all the data traffic globally? Of course, that's an impressive thing. Uh, and it's a kind of tradition. We have, we have for ages invested in R&D, educational system. I think that's the basic point of every country wants to compete in the global economy to actually be good at this, to foster this kind of environment. But it's not only that. It's also kind of an environment of creativity, uh, educational system that allows people to take their own responsibility, to challenge things, to be dem democratic in a way that actually we're very... We're, we don't have big hierarchies in Sweden. Uh, almost any employee can take their own decisions and make things together with other people. That's kind of creative environment to spur innovation. So I would say R&D, education, is the obvious answers to what actually facilitates good innovation climates. But it's not enough. I think in the future you will ask yourself, where do people want to be? In what kind of society do I want to raise my children? Uh, are, are women part of the innovation process? Uh, therefore, I think other questions will arise. And that's why when I ask the startup scene in Stockholm, I, mean, I say that, I, I don't think it's as well known as the big companies of Sweden. The startup scene in Stockholm now competes with Silicon Valley in producing unicorns uh, per capita. Uh, and people are coming there because of the talent, because of the creativity, but also because of the environment, also about the gender equality, it's about values, it's about a social safe safety net that actually brings something else to life, quality of life. I think these aspects will be even more increasingly important when you talk about creativity and innovation. I think, so the East and West is one thing of putting it, I think the North still has something to contribute when it comes to this. A third element, I would say, is openness. Because the, the, the reflection from Sweden is that we're such a relatively small country in a global economy, so the startup scene in Stockholm don't think of Sweden as their market. No one does, because they know it's not enough. So they think globally directly. So this kind of mental shift that we as a small country has that the, the world is our future is very good for us because we see that the companies and markets that are related to the global economy in global value change, they are more competitive and more innovative than branches or companies that are not. So to be exposed to global trade is very good for us. And I see trends in the world that continents or countries are 
looking themselves, thinking they can create a market inside themselves. I think that's the wrong way to go. I think openness when it comes to people, trade, data flows, uh, will be a very crucial po po uh, point for, for innovation. That's why I think also uh, when it comes to people, uh, freedom of speech, uh, uh, the openness of internet, these are very important factors when you think about creativity and innovation in a modern society. So ask yourself which kind of society will foster and attract talent and creativity. I think there are some good society around the world that have good opportunities to take advantage of this, otherwise society will have to change to meet this because otherwise the climate will not be there to attract talent and create creativity. Thank you. So you've added a fifth dimension, actually, which is societal innovation mm -hmm. and the, the culture mm -hmm. and underpinnings of the, of the, the framework of four elements, perhaps, um, and saying, actually, uh, the, the West can become a global, can think globally, and we can all think globally. Mm -hmm. But then I'd like to turn to you, Chen, and, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about, um, you know, in your view, um, how can China further drive innovation? How can... Um, in your view, uh, the West be surpassed as a, as a global innovation powerhouse? Well, I just uh, talked to you that I believe the West will be surpassed by uh, China and those uh, emerging economies. Not now, but it may take some time in the future, let's say. The reason that I, um, I saw only 2% of people say be possible it's, which that was is, my interpretation, mm -hmm. non-scientific interpretation. Well, let's say 2%. But, yeah, we don't quote uh, that it's, which, is, which is not a surprise. <laughs> it reminds me one fact. That is Vice President of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. May last year, he gave a speech in um, U.S. Air Force College. I noticed his speech. Can you believe it? In his speech, he said, well, I can challenge you. Let you tell me. Any innovative project, any innovative change, any innovative um, initiative came from China. Any. He said, no, zero. You check the, uh, Joe Biden's speech. And so I'm not surprised that very few people mm -hmm. believe that West will be surpassed. Mm -hmm. However, that's its traditional feeling. Actually, for example, China and India, they change a lot. Just like you mentioned, we invest last year over or close to $200 billion for R&D, which you never believe it. It was, well, I, I'm a scientist. That was no more than 1% of GDP. It was great 10 years ago. But last year, our investment in R&D reached to 2.09% in China. If you reach over 2% in the world, that means government pays so much attention to R&D, which, which is really great. As a scientist, we feel now more research budget in our hand. Once, one thing I need like to emphasize the change, which is surprise, government bring the money, central bank money, so $50 billion. 70% of the money came from cooperation, the company, which never ever, I mean, show in the history in China. They always government pay money, but 70% of research budget, R&D budget, came from Chinese company. That is very big change. And I can tell very simple, several facts. Uh, you all know that the high speed rail mm -hmm. in China is doing so well. Nuclear power station, that's a lot of new invention, in, uh, you know, innovation there. And then two things which is so surprised, last week, a couple of weeks ago, I did some investigation, research on that area. Two things. One is a solar energy, which invented in Europe, very famous in Europe for wind energy. Second one is a solar energy. And can you believe it? Just in a couple of years now, to last month, we have 100 million volt, uh, kilovolt for wind energy. We have uh, 350 Kilo, uh, kilowatts, 350 million, uh, 350 million kilowatts for solar energy. It makes in the world number one and number two. Uh, 10 biggest companies for producing equipment. 
four of them are in China now. And that's no more than five years or ten years. So supplies change. Mm. And for basic research, you now you see uh, that the new material, nanometer materials come along very fast, called graphene. The graphene research goes on very well here. It's very innovative, mm -hmm. the graphene. And then uh, second is quantum communication. That the quantum communication is a concept, but it is in action now. The Chinese are considered building a quantum communication in the world, the first time show in the world. It will be from Beijing to Shanghai, the quantum communication. It will be the truth. And then Joe Biden said, well, give me the one. Anyone came from China. That was ridiculous. I mean, you see uh, things are changing now in China. The same thing happened in India. The big population in two countries, there's lots and lots of students sent it to American, sent it to European countries for learning. And now return, for, for example, I was a PhD student in Washington University. Return back, I learned a lot of biotechnology, molecular biology. So return back to China, quickly establish a, a research laboratory, lab, laboratory, and then run a company. And then a uh, very short time, we produce our alpha, in alpha interferon, which is used for hepatitis disease patient. We produce 70% of alpha 1B interferon for patients. So what I want to say is that we have a chance. It takes time, learning slowly, but move fast. And sooner or later, I would say that we can surpass some country in the West, in particular area. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. There's a perception issue, and then there, there's going to be a lot of speed, and things are going to change very, very fast. And I think you see that in the uh, rankings of uh, innovative companies around the world, and how fast those yeah, change. I just, add, I just add one more Please. data to you. Uh, in year 2002, the, internet, uh, the invention patents, which mean innovation, intention, uh, invention patents in China ranked number seven in the world. However, in year 2012, two years ago, three years ago, we China first time passed US uh, invention patent applied. In the uh, United States, year uh, 2012, that year, in the US, about 450,000 450, patents applied. China, uh, 50, uh, 400, uh, 400, 60 southern pattern applied. So year 2012, China in history, first time we our pattern applied higher than the United States, than num number one, and which is very important data to show Absolutely. that the invention and innova innovative. Perfect, thank you. Turning to Amy now. Amy, you're going to tell, perhaps you could give us if there are any insights from the, the book you're publishing that would help you argue vehemently that in fact <laughs> Chen is wrong, that in fact the West will not be surpassed, that there's a different way of thinking about this. Yes, so I do not believe the West will be surpassed as the entrepreneurship or innovation engine in the world. Um, and I'm going to say West, I'm thinking of it from a US perspective. So I spent four years working in the White House um, doing international trade and economics. I spent the last five years at Harvard University studying entrepreneurs in the United States. So I interviewed the top 200 founders um, to distill the skill set and the mindset of entrepreneurs uh, across the US. What we see that's really unique um, is that certainly we have founders in technology. Uh, many people look to Silicon Valley. So uh, when you spend time with people who start companies like Airbnb or LinkedIn, PayPal, Facebook, et cetera, you see that they are harnessing this technology trend, right? But the great thing about the United States is you also can find founders that start, uh, as Chipotle did, a Mexican restaurant, a fast casual chain that goes to scale, or Chobani, a Greek yogurt company, or Under Armour, a sports company, or Spanx, a women's undergarments company, right? You see across the regions and across um, the sectors in the US that these innovators are popping up all over. Um, so the book that I've published, it's in all in English speaking world now called The Creator's Code. The idea is that anyone can create 
I'm using the word creator instead of entrepreneur. Um, the code, as deciphered through this five years of research, is the six skills that these US innovators have in common. Um, the book comes out on Monday in China, so I'm very excited in translation to see the Chinese creators mm. and what they will do as well. Um, but I'll say, I'm trained as a sociologist, I also have an MBA, I'm fascinated with the people. It's the people who will drive the next trends, right? So that's what I look at. I think in the United States, the system, I'll outline a couple things that makes it really unique. Um, there's a recipe here, the ingredients we can know. It's hard though to have it come together in a way um, that has been the United States, right? One is the university system. So we have the greatest universities um, in the world. That helps us train our people. It also helps attract the brain power from across the globe. Um, that's really not to be underestimated because when you look at a company like <coughs> PayPal, I'll use it as an example, Elon Musk comes from South Africa. He enters the United States to study at the University of Pennsylvania, studies economics and physics. Um, he's one of the PayPal founders. Another one is Max Levchin. He comes from the Ukraine. He comes in to study at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It's a great um, computer science powerhouse. Um, they partner with Peter Thiel. He's trained out of Stanford undergrad and law school. Those three founders create a company. Uh, when the tech bubble bursts, they sell it to eBay for $1.5 billion in 2002. It's when everyone thought doom and gloom was hitting Silicon Valley. They actually succeed. The much more interesting thing about this is what happens next, which is the first 12 people at PayPal go on to seed the entire next wave of the internet. Mm. So they start LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp, they invest the first money behind Facebook, they do Yammer, Palantir, Elon is building Tesla Motors and SpaceX, Solar City, et cetera, the list goes on and on and on. That's the original PayPal team. Um, we had two immigrants there, so here's the sec second part of our system. Universities attract people, immigration policy, and this you know, is on the verge of breaking in the US, but the immigration policy is to bring in great talent. A third factor is access to capital. Our capital markets work. Um, you can have an idea and you can find money for it, right? That's a really strong part of the system. So whether it's in the capital markets you know, at scale or whether it's angel investing, venture funding, crowdfunding, there's ways that good ideas find money to back them. Um, another thing is the rule of law. So we're a rules-based system. If you break the law, you can be prosecuted for it. Um, that helps to protect creators who will originate ideas we've never seen before. Um, the trust is a really big factor in this system too. And this sounds like a soft thing to say, but if you are going to build an idea that the world has never seen, you really have to trust the, the partners that you build that um, new concept with. So in Silicon Valley, a handshake is a handshake. Um, if you say, I will build this with you, that is how it works. That is a really big competitive advantage. Um, and then I would say, lastly, there's this great optimism in the United States. I mean, it is not a perfect system. It's far from a perfect system, but it's a very hopeful system. Um, and if you tell me I want to move and build my life in a place that's beautiful, where nature is everywhere you look, um, where people around you are collaborators, they want to help you build something, they're educated, there's money there to help you if you actually have a good idea. Um, and if you get it wrong, and if you fail, you can get up one more time. That does not look like Beijing to me, that looks a lot like Northern California, right? So there's the argument that I don't think the West is going away. Thank you. So now, Francis, I don't know how we did this, but we are allowing you to decide which <laughs> camp you want to join. So tell us, do you think the West will soon be surpassed as the world's mm -hmm. innovation powerhouse, uh, and why? No, look, I would give a qualified answer. <laughs> but, you know, okay. So I would say it depends on what you mean by soon. Uh, if you take the Chinese view of history, of course, then I'd say definitely yes, you know, soon uh, gives us a, a certain amount of time. Uh, but what we do notice, I think, is that innovation is a long-term game. It's not something, despite the acceleration of history with uh, rapid, rapid technological progress, nevertheless, innovation capacity and building innovation capacity, I think, is a long-term game. Uh, despite that, I think we have all the indicators to say that uh, the West will be surpassed. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that I think that innovation is going to disappear in the West. Uh, it is still going to be strong, but it's going to be a much more multipolar world in innovation, and we will see <clears throat> Asia in particular, I think, uh, rising. <clears throat> uh, what are the reasons? Um, well, just before going to the reasons, let me make one other comment about it being a long-term game. You were kind enough to mention that we publish a Global Innovation Index, a 2015 version of which will be published next week. We do notice a certain stability in the top 20. Uh, there are two uh, Asian economies in the top 20, namely Korea and Japan. China ca came in last year at around about 29, rising rapidly, of course. Uh, and an index favours smaller economies because they achieve greater evenness. Uh, so it's much larger, it's much more difficult for a large economy to score well on an index. And so we see very, very good scores, uh, of course, from Switzerland, Scandinavian countries, and a number of the smaller economies with a very even performance. Now, why I, uh, is it going to change? Well, I would agree with Kevin, first of all, demographics. The demographics give us all the reasons uh, to suggest that uh, here the, the center of demography is going to be Asia. It is already Asia. I'd say secondly, <clears throat> economic capacity and development. Uh, and with uh, rising e e economic development, you find rising middle classes. Innovation is basically a surplus activity. Uh, and you need to have that capacity, that economic capacity at the outset in order to be able to engage in innovation. Then I'd say thirdly, the strategic focus that one finds, particularly in Northeast Asia, in China, uh, but also in Japan and in Korea. An incredible strategic focus on innovation as uh, an engine of growth and as uh, the future. I don't think you see that to the same extent elsewhere in the world, with due respect to the Minister for Innovation of Sweden, but you don't have that same comprehensive, I think, focus. And then lastly, I'd say competition. Uh, with the, rise, the change in the economic centre of gravity, with the change in the demographic uh, centre of gravity, the competition is going to be increasingly here, and I think the competition also spurs innovation, and we will see increasing competition in this part of the world. So for all of those reasons, I would say yes, uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is happening. There are plenty of indicators, as you have mentioned, uh, Professor Chen. I, I could give you one other indicator, which is international patent applications. You mentioned patent applications. It's only an indicator. But in 1994, 20 years ago, uh, Japan, China, and Korea accounted for 7.6% of all international patent applications. Last year, they accounted for 38%. More than Europe, more than the United States of America. OK, it's a quantitative measure. We do need to deal with quali qualitative measures. And a final word, perhaps, is that um, I very much liked Kevin's division of uh, innovation. I would tend to switch the last one, if I may, into market creating innovations. And I don't think we yet see that uh, in Asia. Um, that is, the innovation, like take the smartphone, smartphone, nobody asked for the smartphone, it didn't exist. It created a whole market which was unimagined. Uh, that market creating innovation, I think, we have not yet seen emerge predominantly from Asia, and that's the long-term game. Wonderful, thank you. Now, each person has made their initial comment. I'm going to give you a chance just in a, in a minute each, if, if you can, um, to perhaps reflect on anything else you heard from the other side. Um, and any, any comments you'd like to make to, to really uh, refute perhaps what, what you heard or, or to make your case even stronger. And then we'll have a few comments from the audience. Um, then we'll vote again with the audience, see how persuasive our, our speakers have been. And then we'll just allow a wrap up here uh, from the speakers to perhaps give a little bit of their own perspective as well. Kevin, back to you. Just well, how, how would you react to what I you I would heard? react by saying the great thing about being on this side of the argument <laughs> is we can actually agree with what Amy and, and the minister said, because at the end of the day, I don't question that the American model of innovation that you outline works. I don't question that what's happening in St Stockholm works. I think what we're saying is actually we need to step back and realize there are other models of innovation, and they actually work quite well. 
So I think Japan showed there are other ways to do breakthrough innovation in automotive than relying on an individual, a venture capitalist, and a great American domestic market to create the world's best motor cars. And that, I think, is the point. What is actually happening is that the models of innovation that lend themselves to innovation in the consumer sector, that lend themselves to innovation in process, that lend themselves to innovation around engineering, require a certain scale, benefit from the ability to have the world's best suppliers competing in your domestic market to gain share, because that's what's happening here in China. Mm -hmm. This is the battleground for the German auto companies. It's China. What does that mean? It means you get this learning laboratory. And Chinese companies are very good at taking things and evolving them. It used to be China was the innovation sponge. I think what we're arguing is China's on the path to being an innovation leader in these three areas. How you define this fourth area, I think, is very fair. This notion of the hero innovation breakthrough, it is true to say that the model doesn't work so well in that. But arguing against this other model of innovation that is different from the American model, different from the model in Sweden, and saying it won't work, I think is very dangerous. And I think when you look at the forces that are at work, demography, comp competition, forces the West recognizes, actually, they're playing out here in the East, and they're playing out specifically in China. And that's why I think we're arguing that there's going to be a rebalancing. And so if the West is not surpassed, it's at least now a conversation which requires the Eastern model and the Western model to meet. And isn't that a great thing for the world, that we have this battle on the innovation front? Let's keep the battle there, because that's a good thing for all of us. Yeah, um, I agree with you that uh, both say that how good it is in the US, in United States system. I agree with you that indeed you have a strong human resource, very talented people. Many countries being brain jam, we call brain jam. The top students left the country to USA, not from China, not only China, but other countries. So you've got the best talented people, whole world to the United States or some other countries in Europe. That's one thing for sure. Second, uh, highly touch in my mind that is financial combined with technology. A very good VC, venture capital, money, and PE, very sophisticated system in America, in Silicon Valley, in, in, in uh, New York area, or some other area, very, very sophisticated. You know, the fin financial combined with science and technology. Any new discovery in the laboratory, well, I was studying there, that the Monsanto company quickly come over and say, let's do it. I will apply patent for you, and let's make it into a business, which is not show up in China or in some other developing country that kind of fast. And so two things, one is human resource, second is financial support. So make it high technology goes very well, very fast. So you can list in NASDAQ, you can make money, and then invest more project. Agree with you. Uh, there is a short hands in our country, in China, or in many developing countries. But one thing I like to say that, again, emphasize it, that we are learning so fast. Can you believe, even if you do the research, how many uh, VC companies in China, 10 years ago and today, you might be so surprised to find that that is not just uh, 10 times or 20 times. It changes so much. Now, in Beijing, you really easily to find the VC if you have good technology. That's not shown up in 10 years ago. What I want to say is things really change so fast in China. So we have a, more people know the name called VC, and more people know the name called PE. It never, I mean, many people did not know before that, that the words called VC. So things are changing now. And the good thing is the Chinese economy moved up. So now got the money. Uh, I say 2.09% of GDP for R&D. Government put a 4% of GDP in education. You might have heard that. Which is so surprised if you can put a 4% of GDP in education. That means university got the money. High school, university got the money. Indeed. So now you see many universities we are taking the foreign students to our country now. You go to Beijing University, Tsinghua University, quite a few foreign, you know, foreign country students are studying uh, in our country. So what I want to say is when your economy move up again and again, and so situation will change a lot. We slowly learn it. And so you say four advantages. 
you will see one by one will show up in this country. And so I say, I feel very happy about the future because I know the day will come in. It's just a soon or, sooner or later. Excellent. I like the fighting talk. Back to you, Michael. <laughs> Final points. One thing first, uh, I do not challenge the shift to Asia. Uh, that's the basic line in every speech I hold in Sweden. I think Sweden is too much reliant on Europe today. 70% of our trade and export goes to Europe. That's part of the economic problem of Sweden, that we're not on the emerging market. We're not that much on the gro growing market of the world. This is the shift we have to do as a society. So I don't challenge that. I don't challenge that other countries are running faster than before. We don't see that Sweden is dropping. Sweden is not running as fast as some other countries are doing. So we're being caught up by other countries. And we see that. So we have to run faster to stay in kind of a pole position. We understand this. And the, the reason why I, I still, uh, just one thing first. Uh, I think our strategy is to link up with Asia. Uh, we don't, uh, Sweden is quite particular here. We have welcomed Huawei's investments in Sweden, uh, the, the homeland of Ericsson. We have welcomed Geely's cooperation with Volvo. Now Volvo is boosting in Sweden uh, R&D centers, growing and, and doing very well in Sweden, actually better than with the American owners of Volvo. And this is very interesting. Sweden is an open country. We have made the strategic choice to link up with the global economy. And that's choice we have to make with Asia now, to, to find partners, to innovate together with Chinese or Asian partners. So this is our strategy. My question is, will the Chinese society change as much? Will people feel the freedom to make strange decisions? Uh, we know that many of the entrepreneurs uh, are not the mainstream figures. They're the outsiders. Uh, in, in my views, the digital transformation will be the driving force for many of the in in innovation processes. Will the internet be open? Will data flow flow? Will people be allowed to express themselves? This is very important questions if you want to be a society where it grows. And then I think in the long run, I think environmental issues, uh, and more soft issues like raising a family, gender equality, uh, free universities. These are aspects of life, good life, that I think will be an advantage for a small country like Sweden to actually compete and present something else than the other uh, global players are do. Thank you. Amy, a last word for the motion. So, um, I, if you tell me that you would build a billion dollar in revenue business in China, I will believe you. Um, so I heard from the other side, we have scale, we are building really fast. I believe that. Um, in the United States, we call that a unicorn, a zero to billion dollar revenue company. I think we're going to see many Chinese unicorns. Um, but I think the model is inspired by something that we see right now in the US innovation or in the Western economy. Um, so I think there is a Google of China, an Amazon of China, an eBay of China, a Facebook of China. We can name um, what those companies are here. Um, you know, questioning, in my mind, the biggest thing is not talent that we see in China. I think the, the question mark is around trust. Um, so trust is so big in an innovation economy of, if you have a novel concept, if you originate something, will people partner with you? Will they help you? Will you take, you know, will they steal it from you? Or will they take it away? Will they quash it? Or can you trust the people in and around you? Um, and international partners as well, internal, external. I think that's a really big question. Um, and I think that um, going forward, I don't doubt the scale in China. I think the two big global for forces that we see driving the world economy are China, as one of them, and technology as another one. So I look forward to partnering with Excellent. you. Excellent. All right. <laughs> We're going to ask for two, maybe three questions from the audience. I've got, so one, I'm going to try and choose from different parts. There's nobody there. Not fast enough. Not fast enough. So two, three. OK. And we'll hear each of them in turn, and then maybe the, the group can respond. Austin, please. And uh, there's a mic coming around. <coughs> the gentleman with the orange tie at the very front. Yeah, Austin O'Kerry from Computer Warehouse Group, Lagos. I'm also an entrepreneur in residence at Columbia Business School. 
uh, I think is, to me, not a two-way race, the way it's put. Um, there are going to be different aspects, and there's even going to be a dark horse that comes in. Uh, if you talk about creative innovation, clearly, the West, and especially America, I, I think is going to be ahead of the race by a country man. For the same reasons we've talked about. Best graduates uh, go there, uh, intellectual property, high-speed internet, and so on. But when you talk about innovation in manufacturing, then obviously China is ahead. Everybody's manufacturing in China. They just know how to take something and make it to scale. Yeah? But talk about innovation in consumption. I think Africa is where it is. We have a mobile phone. We have banking. And we combine the two to make mobile banking to serve our specific needs. We have e-insurance because we don't have a health care system that works so everybody contributes through their mobile phone to a pool that serves as health insurance. If you talk about medical tourism or medical innovation, then India is ahead, or even in software. So I don't think that it's going to be one type of innovation, which is creative innovation, but innovation in many aspects, consumption innovation, creative innovation, and manufacturing innovation, and probably other ones. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So actually, to the panel, what about the rest of the world? And I think last year, in your report, you talked about how sub-Saharan Africa showed the greatest increase. Um, let's go to another, the gentleman at the back with the glasses, the second question, and then you can respond mm -hmm. to whichever one. <coughs> Brian King, uh, your mark. Uh, this is uh, to Professor Chen. Um, while I am, of course, don't, don't believe I am a, uh, no, it's not going to shift to Asia. Um, I believe it could if um, two things. One, the government gets out of the way. Um, I have to question innovation speaks to a free flow of information, as was mentioned. Um, why am I, why are we penalized um, foreigners here if we can't check our internet, or use our sites that we rely upon? Um, obviously, this is not a free, free flow of information when the internet is blocked and censored. And also, um, Professor Chen also mentioned <clears throat> that Joe Biden made a comment. Joe Biden is not the voice of innovation in America. <laughs> if, I agree with you. If it was maybe Al Gore, I could say, okay, maybe. maybe uh, Joe Biden is the vice president. And unfortunately, I see China always referring and comparing itself on a state-to-state -state basis. It's China versus America. America versus China. Uh, globalism is America's fault. Um, so once the Chinese government and people like Professor Chen understand that it's not the government, and it's the people, it's the entrepreneurs, it's the young kids building their businesses. And when, if they're being supported by the rule of law, as was mentioned, then maybe, definitely, uh, it can go to Asia. But using Western innovation does not make China an innovator. Okay, thank you. We had one final question here, if you can keep your comment brief. I'm going to ask you to keep in character when you answer these questions. It's going to be tricky. I'm not so. going to support either. Um, US, sir, it's going to be in China. But my belief is that globalization and disruptive technologies make innovation pervasive all around the world. Yeah. It'll happen everywhere. There's no barriers for innovation any longer. As I guess uh, Nicholas Negroponte once said, you know, borders between um, countries are etched in uh, sand. Like wind grows, you know, the, uh, the borders can change. So my comment is that it's going to go and become pervasive all along. That's one. And quickly, the second one is, that China and India will also have an advantage in terms of doing frugal innovation. Uh, the ability for people uh, to go afford uh, is going to be far, far different from what happens in the Western world. So the opportunities are plenty in terms of doing frugal innovation. Frugal does not mean cheap. It's basically making sure, creating a value for the type of money that they get paid. Thank you. Thank you. So have we considered all parts of the world? Have we considered all types of innovation? One final quick, anybody who wants to answer those questions, and then we're going to ask you to vote again in the audience and see if you've changed your mind. <clears throat> Francis. If I may make uh, two comments. Uh, one, yes, I do agree with the gentleman in the orange tie. Uh, you know, I, I do think there is an important role for especially user-driven innovation, and that's what I think we see uh, a lot in Africa, particularly in East Africa. So we've seen uh, M-Pesa emerge. We've seen a lot of innovations in the mobile banking. And these are user-driven rather than producer-produced, I think, innovations. 
you know, the handheld electrocardiograms, another good example. Uh, you can't bring people to the hospital, so you bring the electrocardiogram to the people. And I think this, this is what uh, is a feature of innovation. But so it underlies that we have an extraordinary variety in innovation. The other point, if I may make, it's a slightly parochial point, if you would excuse me, is that I think uh, despite the fact that innovation is shared and open, uh, or in fact because of that, uh, we see uh, increasingly a tension between collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and I think this underlines the point that we do need a rules-based system. Uh, unfortunately, developments are such that there is a sort of balkanization of the rulemaking uh, powers around the world and we see a lot happening bilaterally, plurilaterally and not a lot happening multilaterally despite the fact that globalization tends to suggest we need global rules. I'm not suggesting rules in the, in the sense of there are two sorts of lawyers, there are those who say you can't do it and there are others who say well if you want to do it this is the way you do it. I think we need rules to facilitate the global networks, the free flow of information. We need rules to uh, achieve what Premier Li Keqiang spoke about this morning, <coughs> global industrial capacity, because these are built on information networks and the sharing of information, and there must be some rules which say where you allocate the competitive advantage and where you allocate the public domain. Perfect. Thank you. Would Professor Chen, you had a, no, you're fine. I think the only thing I would just think <laughs> is, I think it's very important to recognise that the models of innovation are wide and varied. And I think I could point to you many examples where Chinese companies are absolutely into innovating in the internet in ways that American companies haven't even thought of. And I think it's important to understand that we are seeing an innovative gene that applies wherever you are in the world. How that then gets nurtured and how it gets manifested looks different. So if you go online in China and you know WeChat, Taobao, and you look at the kind of things that are happening on there, I think you'd be amazed. And I think you'd find many features that are way ahead of their US counterparts. The reverse is also true. And I think that is what's going on here. We have different models of innovation that apply in different ways. But I think it would be a mistake to characterize the only way that we can get breakthrough innovation is through the combination of a hero entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, and a society around it. Because we've had massive breakthroughs in innovation happening in this part of the world in very different ways, where the power of collective thought where the innovation comes because many people are in large entities that work together to invent something. And now the original idea has long gone. So the technology in a new high-speed rail chain here in China, yes, it's a high-speed rail chain, it's a bullet train of some sort, but it's moved on very substantially from the original. That is innovation. And so I think we have to recognize that what's good, I think, for the world is that we have these very different models of innovation and if they are harnessed for the common good, that's a great thing. And Africa absolutely is going to innovate in places where it needs to innovate and has done in food and many other areas. We can look to Africa as being a model for innovation of another kind. And all these models have to be respected. We shouldn't just celebrate one and assume it's the only way to have a breakthrough occur. Just one, two comments. First is geography is getting less and less important. Uh, it's not about countries only, it's about regions of the world, it's about uh, communities that are very uh, interesting and try new things. So I think the geography thing, with internet geography becomes more and more less valid. But the other thing is that I do see kind of a global trend that goes against all this. More and more protectionism, more and more nationalism. This is really a threat to the, what we're talking about here. Uh, agreeing on standards, global rules. This is on questions mark now. And now we've talked for, for ages that we're globalizing the world. Is it really going in that direction right now with the, the trade negotiations, with these kind of nationalistic protectionism trends in Europe or elsewhere? You see a lot of trends that goes in the, the wrong direction as well. And this will be a hinder for innovation, I think. And I think people still think the old logic that we can, on our market, fix innovation, the old models. This is not the way to actually develop innovation. And that's why, where I'm a bit afraid, uh, where, where the world is going right now. So I'd like to pick up on that as well. Um, I think that you see global innovators, when they get to scale, they all know each other. These entrepreneurs, Jack Ma is Chinese, 
Um, Elon Musk is you know, living in the United States. Larry, Larry and Sergey, the Google founders, they know each other. Um, so the nationalism trends are political. I think a lot of the innovators and entrepreneurs, um, you know, they have a lot of connections across. And breaking out of this debate mold a little bit, I will say I am really curious about some of the models coming up in China. So WeChat versus WhatsApp, um, my money's on WeChat, right? An integrated platform. It's amazing what's going on here um, in that smartphone mobile space. Another thing that I'm really looking at and curious about is Alipay and WePay as something that's now disintermediating the banking financial sector. Um, in the last few months, they are basically an asset management technology company with 100 billion in assets under management. If I were sitting in my, I had worked at JP Morgan at one point, if I were at JP Morgan now, I would really be watching that um, as an international bank, right, coming out of China. So I think that we are seeing lots of these ideas um, in many places, and like Kevin said, it is different models for different places, but they are coming onto the global stage. We are globally linked. So we already, have, hang on just a sec, because I would like to hear what the audience thinks. Now they've heard everyone, and then I will come back to you. But we already have members of a debating, debating team switching to the other side, I'm hearing. So. We're collaborating. We're okay, collaborating. I okay. We'll, we'll, we'll pitch <laughs> yeah. it that way. So at the start, we asked you a question, and we got a, a 2% uh, for, no, 2% against. Is that right? 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2 against said against yes. Against right, against I'm already forgetting. Against. So we're going to ask again, and again, a show of hands, please. Will the West soon be surpassed as the world's innovation powerhouse? Those four. There's a few more. We've got a few more there. I would say 10%. we've got a 10%. I think we've got a 10%. All right, let's, let's, to be complete, you know, those of you who would say no, I am seeing more people undecided. 15%. You'd say 15%. We have a scientific opinion right here, <laughs> completely unbiased as well. Excellent. Question counterintuitive to innovation. The fact that one or the other is going to. So, so the purpose of this discussion was set up as a debate, specifically so that sure. we could get a little bit more dynamism in the conversation. So what I'm going to do now is turn to each of our panelists and ask them a little bit for a little bit more nuance, perhaps an, a couple of thoughts or a couple of reactions that you've had as you've listened, a couple of thoughts to, for the audience to take away. Professor Chen. Yeah, I'm happy that we increase about... 8% uh, from 2% to 10% <laughs> after <laughs> debates. Thank case. you very much. Speed uh, and perception. Uh, right thank you very much. And um, I thank you very much for explaining uh, VP uh, uh, Joe Biden's uh, uh. points. I was really sad on his speech on the uh, US Air Force College. He said, I mean, he said real words. I, I didn't, did not change at all. Say, I challenge you. You tell me any, pro any innovative project products and initiative came from China. And I was pissed off on that because I don't feel happy about that. So uh, thank you very much to give me opportunity to tell the truth, the fact. It's indeed a change. And you just mentioned WeChat. I mean, you cannot believe it. Every kid played WeChat. This is amazing. I even myself play it every day, maybe every hour. So the whole thing is changing in China. And we need to open our mind uh, to see the China. And last point, I say, well, maybe a competition, but you are right. Later on, you know, whole world of globalization, then you will see collaboration, competition to make the human being is a better life. And that's what our premier Li Keqiang say: more collaboration in the future. Thank you. Amy, any final words? We have 30 seconds, perhaps, per speaker. Sure. So I would say um, we live in a global environment, economy. And uh, in the entrepreneurial and innovation space, everyone wants a cure for cancer. It doesn't matter what your national you know, um, background is. We all want clean water. We all want exploration of space. We, will all, we want many of the same things. And that entrepreneurs and innovators are the people who will solve that. So we need to do it together. And so I, I also don't like the construct of us versus them. I actually don't think it's reality. So I think it's together. 
Michael. I think the best argument is uh, really valid. It comes with the customer or persons. They drive innovation, what they need and what they want. And in Asia, the biggest market uh, will be here. Uh, so I, of course it will spur innovation and drive many of the innovations around the globe uh, because it is here, it, uh, it, it will happen. Kevin? I think the wonderful thing is we have different models of innovation. We need to keep the playing field open for all those models to thrive. And we should celebrate all of them because at the end of the day, the world needs to improve its productivity. There's a lot of people who need to get fed, a lot of basic needs that need to get met. I think respecting that those different models can exist together and keeping the playing field open so that we can actually find a way for the competition to be one that is ultimately productive rather than nationalistic in tone is vital. I think that's probably the most important overtone to all of this. But let's remember, innovation isn't just one thing. It's many different forms, and I think we should celebrate all of them. The last word to you, Francis. Uh, let's respect the diversity of innovation models. I agree entirely. And let's have a, some, a, a framework of rules that supports the innovators and supports global innovation rather than prohibits supportive. Perfect. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panellists who played a wonderful game here today. I hope you've enjoyed the debate today. Thank you very much for being here, for your wonderful questions, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.